Hello everybody. So, um, I haven't done one of these in a while, so I thought, hey, I owe you one. Um, I've been, um, putting up on my YouTube channel, um, Operation Nina videos. If anybody's been over there, you've seen those go up. Um, I haven't really been promoting them on my, um, Facebook lately because I've just been really involved with living life and mom's treatments and mom's treatments have been getting more intense so that's kind of where our focus has been um so i'm here to give you guys an update on um kind of what happened today i know that i've i've kind of scared a, a bit of you um and then i've just been dealing with everything as it's happened so i haven't really had time to kind of fill you in on on what's gone on um so, as you guys know, today was mom's third brachytherapy treatment. For those of you who don't know what brachytherapy is, I do encourage you to Google it to get a accurate pictorial of um, what it is and definition of what it is. But in, in layman's terms, describing it um, as best as I can, as quickly as I can for you, um, as to not put too um much emphasis on that so i can further with the story um basically they use instruments to um insert radioactive material straight into um the body to um put the radiation exactly to the tumor to kind of quote fry it at its source um, and it's used in uterine cancer um, mom's cancer currently is considered stage 2 uterine cancer with cervical cancer because the uterine cancer has spread to her cervix so we're fighting two different cancers at once so um, she was having her third treatment of that today and um, it has taken a huge toll on her body. So I don't think that people understand and appreciate what happens to the patient during this because they just think, oh, that's just what's done um, during the treatment. That seems really simple and whatever. Um, but what happens to the patient during this time is they're put under anesthesia. And during the time that they're put under anesthesia, they are, um, their body is manipulated so that scans can be done during that time. They're taken on and off the operating table um, and positioned in different ways that their body isn't normally put into. And for mom, that's a little bit more difficult and complicated because she has the degenerative arthritis in her knees. Therefore, her legs are put into positions that her body cannot cope with when she's awake. Therefore, she has added pain when she comes out of the anesthesia that her body has a hard time coping with once she wakes up. In addition to that, she has a frozen frozen shoulder that is very painful when she's awake normally. Well, they put her in position while she is under anesthesia with that shoulder that's very painful she doesn't feel it when she's under anesthesia but when she wakes up she's in a tremendous amount of pain and they do give her tylenol but the tylenol can only do so much because the procedure itself is painful and so the tylenol can only cover so much pain right so if you're in pain all over your entire body it's only going to cover so much pain right and they can only give you so much because you're a human being and your body can only handle so much pain at a time does that make sense so um essentially the way that they have to position her body to do the procedure, she kind of comes out of the procedure pretty well beat up from all of the positioning that they do to do the procedure. So both of her shoulders, like her, the neck on her one side, all the way down her arm and her shoulder hurts on the one side, on her right side. On her left side, she has the frozen shoulder that hurts. Her knees, because the the degenerative arthritis hurt and are in pain. 
She's got the pain from the lady parts that are expected because they're the ones that are going through the treatment. Then there's the um, pain that she's experiencing from the rest of her body, from the other manipulations that they have to do to her body from the treatment. And then there's the side effects from the treatment itself, the extreme and severe fatigue, the nausea, the upset bladder from the catheter, um, the urgency to have to go to the ladies room, the, um, again, upset tummy, um, and potty issues and different things like that. So basically she just feels awful all the time. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And each time she has a treatment, she literally feels worse. And so today, um, they were having a hard time with the, um, the uh, IV. And so they had her, um, her anesthesiologist put it in. And he put it in on the back of her wrist. And that's a painful place to put your IV in. And so she cried, and it was very painful, and, you know, he was kind of a no-nonsense guy. He didn't do it gently. He did what he had to do to get it done, and on the one hand, that's good because it got done, and it was a prime spot for it, and it was a good vein, <clears throat> and they were able to get it done, but it was bad for her because it was painful, and it hurt, and it was a bad spot for her because that's a spot that, you know, she would have used to prop herself up, and she would need to manipulate her body to try to get comfortable, and, like, her back hurts sometimes, so she has to move on the gurney to try to reposition herself, and every time she would try to reposition herself, she would hit the, um spot on her arm where the IV was and the IV was so painful because her veins are so sensitive from the treatment like it makes your body so sensitive and her veins are so sensitive right now and so it's just such a painful experience and um she was just in so much pain today and um the pain just continued to get more and more severe and difficult and um, it's just been a really rough day. In addition to that, um, because we started a little later in the day, it did not make things any easier. Um, and then um, after all of that happened, um, we called for a cab and they were really busy today because it was a Monday and we called around lunchtime or after lunchtime but you know kind of still in that like you know people were leaving from lunch and going back to work and all that and they were really swamped and um the guy you know wasn't really sympathetic and he pulled up on a curb and she had a hard time and so I was trying to help her and he was just leaning against his cab and really didn't want to like assist in any way and she was to the point where she was like I can't breathe and I need help and like I, I need help and he just sat there and so I'm like, Mom, what do you need? What can I do? Like, I was starting to panic, but trying to stay calm for her and, like, trying to, like, you know, brainstorm. What can we do? How can I help? Should we go inside and get help? Should we stay out here? Should we call, like, Jared for help? Like, what should we do? Should we, like, try the cab again? And then he's like, see ya, and he leaves. And I'm just like, are you for real, dude? Like, you just stood there. Like, at one point, I thought she was going to fall down because she was so weak. And he was a physically fit guy. He could have been on the other side of me helping me because I was trying to keep her up because I thought her legs might give out. And he didn't once, like, try to assist, try to help, try to just be a decent human being. He just stood there propped up against his cab. And I just thought that that was really screwed up because, yeah, he doesn't have an obligation. But as a human being, you would think he would want to help another human being. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but if I see somebody who looks like they need help, I want to help that person. Like, that's just how I am as a human being. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a weirdo. But, like, I try to help people when I can. And I try to be a good person and do good things. And... I just was really unimpressed with this attitude. And then he, he, like, right before he left, he put his hand on my shoulder and he was like, well, good luck. And he leaves. Like, 
I really wanted to turn around and say like, screw you, dude, screw you. But I was more interested in my mom and the fact that she couldn't breathe. And, you know, it was more important to me to focus on her and what she needed and how could I help her because she was more important in that moment. And so I called Jared and said, I'm so sorry. I know that you're in the middle of your work day, but she can't breathe. And we're like on the curb of the hospital and the cab driver just took off and I don't know what to do. And this was like the horrible day and she's so weak and she's so tired and she's in pain and I just, I don't know what to do. And he was like, give me a couple minutes. I'll be there as fast as I can. And he came and he helped us out and, um, we're going to be experiencing some weather here that's not going to be so great. And so we are going to be checking out of the hotel soon. Um, and I'm going back to mom's place to, um, get her safely home so she can rest comfortably. And, um, Jared was so great when we got back here to the hotel. She was so cold because we had to wait out in the cold for the cab. And then after the cab for him to come and she was just so cold and, um, he warmed up her hands and he got a warm blanket around her. And he just was so awesome and so nice and just thought of things that I didn't think of and um, just did so many nice things. So T-Man took some hits today and we're just so worried about mom and, um, and just how we're going to get through the rest of this treatment because we're just, we're having a really, really hard time. Um... Because mom is just feeling so weak and so tired and um, just really struggling. Today was the toughest day that we've had. Um, and I just don't think that um, people really understand how difficult this treatment really is. How painful it is. How scary it is. How much it takes from your body. And... Um, it's the real deal. So I wanted to give you guys an update on what's going on. And um, I will give you another update um, once we're at her place. So thanks for watching. Bye.